Hi, I'm David Spencer. Welcome back to Gardening with Bugs. Today we're going to talk about uh, this early spring garden I've got going and uh, some of the things that I'm doing here to prevent pests from establishing uh, throughout the growing season. Today I want to talk about this uh, successive garden I've got. So I call it successive because this is the garden where I'm going to be uh, doing cut greens and, and a lot of these things are going to bolt and I'm going to have to replace them or, or like carrots, I'm going to be pulling them out and planting new ones. So unlike some of the gardens, like the one that I'm filming from is uh, just a bed of strawberries. And so that one is, it's uh, perennial strawberries. These are the ones that are for this year and a half are going to be garlic sort of thing. But this is one where I'm kind of, um, I'm, I'm constantly planting and constantly pulling out. But what I want to show you is what uh, some of the plants I've got in here are not just for, for edible sake. Um, some of these I've planted in order to help me with my pest management. So I want to show you right off the bat here, these tall plants right here. Uh, this is white mustard, like this kind of mustard that you'd grow for, for seed, for the condiment. Uh, they grow super tall and they have these um, elaborate mustard flowers. Like all, all the mustards actually will bolt and have quite beautiful, like striking yellow flowers. Uh, but these ones are especially tall and have just kind of been selected for that flowering uh, purpose. And right now, I mean, it's, it's April, it's actually Easter weekend. Um, I have just hauled out last year's uh, mustards. Like I put some of them in um, in the fall and I have a cut green section all year. And I, on another video, I'm going to be talking about uh, winter gardening because here on the West Coast, I mean, forget all that cleanup or setting things out too early. You can keep greens going all year, um, especially if you cold, cold plant them. So right now I typically have a lot of mustards flowering. And it's great because things like the hoverflies, which um, which as their larval stage are aphid predators, they show up already, like by, probably by mid-March, some of the species are already flying around and laying eggs where there are aphids, and there are some out here. So this is an important sort of sentinel plant. It's gonna be quite tall, and it's gonna allow for this um, early set of flowers when the rest of the month, I don't want them to hold, so I can even be pinching the flower heads in order to get a little bit more uh, leafy green growth out of them. This one I'm just gonna leave as is. So I've got some lettuces and spinaches. Here's a good example with the bok choy is about to flower and I've pinched off a couple of them. So those bolted and I've got the next set of bok choy um, up and coming right next to it. Um, and then I've got some carrots, uh, that next bok choy and cilantro. But the next row here is just alyssum. So I've got a purple alyssum growing here. Now as I, as I pull crops out and replant them, the alyssum is gonna stay there all, all year. Now the alyssum is, is a very important plant to have. Um, there are alternatives, of course, um, if alyssum is not your thing, but I love it because it's it's sort of a low uh, plant. Um, the flowers are plentiful and it needs little to no care. I mean, you can prune them back and keep them um, shapely, but usually I just let it kind of go wherever. But the most important thing is, is, like a lot of plants with very small flowers, this one tends to attract things like, um, like parasitic wasps a bit bit more than some broad flowers. So keep in mind sometimes the ones that we kind of forget about um, like some of the weeds like Queen Anne's Lace those are those are hugely important flowers because they have they actually have a ton of tiny little flowers and allows for things like flies. Flies have very small mouthpieces so it allows them to walk along and feed at the same time. Likewise something like, uh, like uh, buckwheat or lissom uh, those small cups are full of nectar but they're also very small so they tend to benefit a lot of the tinier bugs. And it's those parasitic wasps, especially here in my yard, I don't introduce them or anything, but they just show up like a phidias, which parasitizes the, uh, the aphid and leaves that little, uh, what we call an aphid mummy, which is like basically the hardened off, off an aphid exoskeleton with the new wasp developing inside. So that is a kind of a permanent addition, but I've had to put it out now. So as soon as I, plant, I put these plants out, like in March or April, or you can wait till May long weekend if that's your thing, but I'm not just planting my lettuces and, and arugula and all that. I'm putting in these flowers as part of my pest management. So as I go along here again, arugula, more lettuce, a mizuna mustard. Um, some of it looked like it was going to bolt, so I, I pinched the top off. Uh, spinach, and now I've got again a row of alyssum and again a row of this this white mustard. So you can kind of see a pattern here. I'm, I'm trying not to have all of the flowers on one side of the garden. I, I'm kind of spreading them out into a sequence and um, I'll apologize for the, the symmetry of lines but I used to love that idea of just a haphazard really dense uh, like bio-intensive garden um, but we found that you know I think the rows look tidier I'm a bit more proud of the way it, it looks when it's in full growth uh, 
but also we find it a bit easier to to weed. And like if my wife doesn't recognize one of the plants I've grown, she's less likely to pull it out if it's in a, if it's in a straight line. So that works for us. Um, but this is the successional garden that goes right up to our, our tall peas, and that's uh, one of the parts of the garden I wanted to show you today. Another thing I need to mention is this uh, container here filled with, I guess, what looks to you like just some white substance. Uh, this is my slug bait. So it's Easter long weekend. It, um, it's been pouring rain, but it's nice and warm. And as soon as it warms up, like as soon as nighttime temperatures here on the coast are, are above six degrees, um, I tend to get tons of slugs coming in. So this was based on the research done by Oregon State University that found that, um, yes, slugs are attracted to things like um, like beer and fermentables, and they tested a whole bunch, um, as well as uh, you can buy store-bought um, slug baits and stuff like that. But they were looking at how expensive some of those are compared to um, when you when you look at large farming seasons. Um, so it'd be way better to find something cheap. And what they found was this, like simple bread dough, was uh, not only effective but it was the cheapest and it lasted longer. So like if I put a beer out, beer trap out here, um, you know the carbon dioxide's attracting a bunch of things, and as soon as that stops. It's that yeasty uh, fermentation product that's going to attract a bunch of things, but it goes bad relatively quickly. What they found with the bread dough is that it could last a week. So imagine that every week you just put out a little cup like this and you start attracting slugs. Uh, the reason why I have it in that tray is because of the rain, uh, because of the rain I wanted to cover it up so most of that rain is hitting the open lid um, and, and sloughing off and it's still open enough that the slugs can get in. So I have those in, in a variety of beds that I'm that I'm concerned about slug damage for this year. So my pest uh, my pest uh, prevention uh, for slugs starts at this time as well. Here's another bed I want to show you, and and um, I want to make the argument that you you definitely don't want to clean up your garden too often. I uh, that um, discussion on the internet typically goes around is people saying like wait till ten degrees to clean up your yard, which is just that doesn't make any sense. Um, if they're talking about dead plant material you can of course clean that up um, and if there's bugs in there that you want to protect just go put that somewhere else you can still you can still work the soil and if you're worried about um, you know the types of solitary bees that live in the soil we'll have other places in the yard where you have bare soil right we're not when I'm talking about um, you know if I'm going to cultivate this little this little plot of land well I still have all the bushes and the rest of the yard around um, but more importantly like I mentioned before before and I will do a video on on winter gardening um, but you can you can plant things like the, this. Um, this was a cauliflower, and I've got some Brussels sprouts here as, as well. Um, these ones, like I'm I'm harvesting Brussels sprouts from I, when they ripen, probably September right through to now. It's still April. I'm I still have Brussels sprouts. The uh, texture and the flavor changes a bit in the spring, um, and some of the varieties are quick to bolt. But it's a great crop to have. Even the kale, I only just pulled them out last week, but I had kale. I was I was still harvesting them. But the nice thing about these uh, biannual plants is they will flower uh, quickly. So if I'm following, like I'm following this bed with onions, um, the onions I'm not going to put in right away. I, I had a really poor year last year with onions, so I'm going to wait till the soil is a little bit warmer before my onions go in. So that gives me time to allow these guys to to flower, um, and that that flowering, just leaving this crop to. Uh, to attract insects in the middle of this garden with more established plants and lots of plant cover is going to be beneficial to some of these beds that are that are more or less empty at this time. I've also got a stinging nettle in this bed and that uh, I'm going to be hauling it out here because it spreads a little bit too much. Um, if you want to grow stinging nettle, um, which is, I love it, I mean, it's, it attracts a lot of insects, uh, it, it's super nutritious. Um, and it's not great for mammals and stuff like that. Bigger ones, because, uh, bigger animals to eat it because of the stinging property. But what you find is the insects that aren't bothered by it absolutely love it. Um, and it is super nutritious and uh, so there's a lot of great uses for it. But um, it spreads by seed and by underground tuber. So um, you, if you're gonna commit to it, um, be prepared that it, for it to take over the bed. So this year I've had it here successfully and it's um, now it's getting to be a bit of a nuisance so I'm going to be pulling it out and moving it. Uh, but it's another great crop. It's, it sprouts up early, early, early in the spring and the, the flowers occur qu um, quite quickly as well. So it's another great crop to have to kind of boost the, the, uh, the number of insects you have. Okay, the last one I want to show you is this uh, hop growing on the side of my greenhouse. Um, sorry, it doesn't look so pretty right now, but it's important to show that the growth is already coming up. 
and what it could potentially die down to. I didn't I didn't trim it last year because um, it was new to this spot, so I wanted to give it the best chance it could. Uh, but what's great about this one is this is going to grow up, and I'm going to build the trellis on the side of the greenhouse here that's going to shade it in the summertime. But the nice thing about the hops is it dies right to the ground every year, so you can trim it right right to the ground. Uh, and that allows for that winter sun and the early spring sun to come back in. But what's so important about the hop for where I live is it gets the invasive hop aphid. Uh, so this aphid is from Europe. And so when it originally came over a couple hundred years ago, or hundred more than a hundred years ago, I guess, um, was that there wasn't a lot of natural predators for it and its population explodes quite quickly. Uh, but what's interesting about that hop aphid is that hop aphid is specific to hops. It overwinters on prunus, so it might do a bit of damage there, but it's really just, its life cycle involves the hop plant and that's it, which is also native to, to North America here. Uh, but that hop aphid is not transferable to other plants, so I could have it absolutely coated in aphids, I could have the vines running right through my garden, they will not, if they go on to another plant, they cannot survive on it. So it's not a problem. So I now have this ability to have a, a battery in the yard, a bank of, of millions of aphids that are going to attract aphid predators. So it's sort of a new concept. I don't hear much about this one, but imagine if your um, aphid prevention in your yard involved growing aphids intentionally in order to promote the number of aphid predators. And that's what I'm doing with this plant. There's others as well, like the lupins. The lupins get a lupin aphid, which again is very specific to that plant. It is, um, a, it is a pea, so there's potentially risks that you could get aphids on a lupin that could also get into your, the rest of your peas, your sweet peas, or, or one of the green beans that you're growing. So there's a bit of potential there, but um, I've never seen that, that aphid go across. So same thing, if I have a, a lupin with a ton of lupin aphid on it, I'm not gonna go and worry about spraying that one off. Um, I've got more lupins anyways, but I know that that is not gonna be a problem. All it's going to do is attract aphid predators. So again, sometimes the, the pest prevention for my whole year starts in the spring with some, with some conscious um, plants that I'm putting in strategic places around the yard especially. But I encourage you to try this one. Some of those plants that get aphids, if it's one that you're not worried about spreading, go ahead and try it. It's, it's fun to watch. You'll see it covered in aphids, then you'll see it covered in aphid predators like ladybugs, and then suddenly the problem's gone all by itself. It's really good lesson in biocontrol that you don't need to do a thing, and it's benefiting the yard for the rest of the year. So give that one a try. Well, thanks for watching this video on uh, early prevention of pests. Um, you know, I, I think there's some helpful tips there there for you and uh, if nothing else please just uh, consider like in a veggie garden planting flowers like don't even worry about which ones uh, every flower is going to have some sort of benefit because you're attracting um, other pests right your leafy greens are attracting things that will eat leafy greens so by having a variety of plants of course you're going to be attracting something else and that's that's really the the game here is the more you have the less one thing is going to be out of balance so I hope that's the takeaway for you, and I'll see you on the next one. Thanks for watching.